Hi, so today we've got another extremely obscure, no doubt originally expensive bit of lab or test equipment. This intrigued me, I just saw this on eBay. The only description was uh, Strain Mapper, made by Laser Optical Engineering Limited, who are a UK company. And looking a bit further, they seem to specialise in something called um, laser shearography, which is for measuring small deviations in the surface of items, typically composites, carbon fibre and so on. As far as I understand, the way this works is it fires a laser, I'm not sure if it's a, like a structured like pattern or just a, a, an expanded beam onto a surface and then uses a camera to look at the fringe patterns to look, yeah, look for um, any deviations from uh, the flat surface. So yeah, this is going to be used for inspecting carbon fibre and so on. Uh, one thing that treat me is this thing does appear to be entirely made out of carbon fibre, which alone obviously makes it uh, somewhat expensive. Well, obviously something like this probably needs very high stiffness um, to maintain optical stability and I wonder if the reason they use carbon fibre rather than say aluminium or something was simply uh, I would imagine this was probably you know, made for people that make stuff out of carbon fibre to do their inspection so it may well be that um, there was some sort of you know, deal going on where say they said you know make us this gear and we'll do the carbon fibre casing for you which is why it's made out of carbon fibre. Laser optical engineering they're actually still going and what I believe is the current version just looks like it's made out of um, aluminium extrusion rather than uh, a complete solid um, piece but obviously this might be a might have been for some slightly different application or the yeah, obviously an earlier version of it. So at the front we've got this great big uh, aperture sort of window and we can see there's a big lens here and a mirror here and there's a knob on the back which adjusts sort of the, 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 the mirror. So obviously the laser comes out here toward, towards this direction and that mirror will obviously adjust the, uh, the angle. And, then, and on this side we've got uh, an optical assembly which will be the, uh, the camera. But there's sort of clearly some more, more than just the camera, there's, sort of, there's clearly some sort of beam split or mirror thing going on here. Uh, it also came with this control box thing, it's just like a power supply and stuff and some cables, um, one from the PED unit to the control box and the other one which doubtless goes to a PC with that connector on it. That's probably something like a National Instruments I.O. card or something to it or maybe a, some sort of custom I.O. device which I didn't get. Taking the end off, we've got a laser down here. This is actually made by a UK company called L4 Light Limited. It says maximum output 300 milliwatts um, but the model number has got a 150 in it so I'm guessing it's probably 150 milliwatt nominal 532 green and this company's still around I actually emailed them and they sent me the manual for this which was nice of them so hopefully we can get this uh, fired up and running and then here we've got this industrial interlock switch this is a fairly elaborate sort of safety interlock type switch clearly yeah, to make sure it shuts the laser off when you open it but uh, for a piece of equipment like this this does seem overkill this is like an industrial thing with a specially shaped interlocking post that sort of slots, slots into here to uh, enable it. The design of this looks fairly elaborate so I'm guessing that's a combination of firstly making sure it's very reliable but also is difficult to bypass by sort of shoving a screwdriver into it. And on this side we've got a, um, a small composite CCTV camera, motorised zoom lens and then this optical block it looks like it has some sort of actuator. I'm guessing this is probably a piezoelectric actuator that can adjust the path length, you know, the optical path length by very small amounts to look at the um, fringing effects. So hopefully uh, I'll see if we can actually fire this up and see what images it's, uh, it can see. This seems to be constructed uh, around this um, carbon fibre box section which obviously is uh, extremely rigid. Um, there's a little bit of control circuitry out there. There's, uh, this looks like a, a rather handmade PCB. I think this is con to control the motors in the um, motorised zoom lens on the camera. And there's a fan here which sort of blows air down here, which I think is primarily for um, cooling the laser. At the end of the camera we've got this actuator, so I think this is a piezo actuator which sort of moves uh, a mirror in this direction. And there's a, uh, a driver made by Piezo System Jenna. And this couples via uh, lovely expensive uh, Limo connectors, you know if something's got Limo connectors on it's really expensive. So I'm fairly sure what's happening here is that our light comes in, gets bounced horizontally onto this mirror on the piezo actuator and then into the camera. So what this piezo actuator do is doing is sort of making very small changes in the distance between the camera and the object. So this is probably imaging the, uh, the laser fringes and then by looking at how those change when you change the optical path length you can actually then measure the um, variation in the surface that the uh, laser is shining on and obviously you're you know, talking about very very small you're talking I think orders of you know wavelength so we, you know sort of sub micron 
distances. So clearly the mechanical rigidity between you know, your laser and everything else has to be maintained you know, within that, that sort of level of precision. Hence the sort of carbon fibre everywhere. This is all sort of braced along the top by these carbon fibre pieces um, onto the mirror mount. It's, it's probably still needs to be you know, used in a very low vibration environment, but obviously you need to have that um, inherent stability. So what I'd like to try and do is if I can fire the laser up and actually look at what's coming through the camera, uh, that might be quite quite interesting and then see if we can um, activate the piezo thing to see how the uh, fringes change. But so I have no idea what, what state this is in, whether the laser is even working. So uh, let's uh, find out. Just looking at the optical path, there is something on the output of the laser, so that could be a, a diverging lens perhaps, or some sort of um, structured light pattern generator, and it bounces off that mirror there, goes up to this mirror here, and then goes through the lens onto this uh, output mirror. This PCB in the bottom, this is clearly a sort of very low volume handmade thing. It's a yeah, home etched type PCB. Obviously bear in mind, yeah, this, this was made back in the days when getting like a single PCB was quite expensive. Yeah, it could also be that yeah, this may have literally been a one-off piece of gear that was just made for one specific application for one customer, or if not, certainly very low quantity, or perhaps this was a prototype. Very old school. I'd imagine probably stepper motor drivers for driving motors within the um, that motorized lens assembly. I think there's also um, a voltage regulator to provide power to the camera. Inside the box is pretty much what we expected. A couple of mains power supplies and the uh, driver for the laser. And just some uh, ins and connect between the uh, the head connector and the uh, that multi-pin connector for the PC. Like construction, this is actually quite annoying because all the wires have been like just threaded through holes and terminated at each end. So it's really hard to just get stuff out. So I think I'm just going to try and just separate out the laser connections for the controller and get that fired up. And as usual for sort of high precision expensive stuff, they use sort of Allen head screws all over the place, which I can sort of understand, you know, if you want some sort of precision fixing or whatever, but just for putting connectors on, it's just a pain in the ass. Just use normal screws. It's really annoying. Okay, I've managed to get this uh, laser fired up. It's quite annoying. It's, it's got a five minute warm up period because it um, has sort of the temperature stabilised the um, laser diode and probably the doubling crystal. Big pile of um, status indicators there. So I've just ripped all the cables away. So I've just got literally power supply going into the driver and then uh, just the uh, laser part of the cable. And it looks like there's a um, diverging lens on the output of this because say the beam is sort of diverging quite quite significantly so this is clearly designed to just illuminate a sort of large area with laser light and then it's going to be detecting um, fringes so I'll sort of screw this back together and see if we can actually uh, get an image through the camera and uh, wiggle that piezo actuator and see what we actually see. Uh, when I was taking it apart I found this uh, little box inside with this relay board and I think what this is is it's for protection of the laser diode because the um, laser driver has a sort of an external connector to connect it to the laser. Laser diodes are very sensitive to transients and ESD and so on so I think what this is doing is it's probably shorting out the laser diode until it gets the sort of signal from the controller to say it's okay we're all connected everything's okay. It isolates the fragile laser diode from anything that could happen on these um, external connectors and uh, this is manufactured by the uh, laser manufacturer so this is clearly a sort of standard accessory they provide for this sort of application where you remote mount the um, driver from the laser head. Um, the camera itself is this little um, unit, it's actually designed for machine vision application, it's got all sorts of options for triggering and synchronising and all sorts of stuff. Um, it's actually a fairly, fairly small sensor in there, um, it's actually a pick in charge of everything in there, got a neat uh, internal construction. And the lens, this is a sort of motorised lens and I've found some data and it's actually just got three DC motors in it for iris focus and zoom so that's uh, fairly easy to control. And this, they've got this filter on the end, uh, this is actually a sort of de a green filter to only capture the green from the laser. And um, interesting on the side it says sort of Vivitar Skylight, so I suspect what they've done is actually just taken an off the shelf, maybe UV, UV filter and just stuck a um, you know, specialist narrow bandwidth uh, lens on there. Yeah, precision optical uh, filters and so on probably aren't generally designed for CCTV type mounts, so that's probably a quick way of uh, making a sort of CCTV mount compatible uh, narrowband filter.
And this is the amplifier for the that piezo actuator. It's a fairly simple device, um, five volts analog in, and it produces up to 150 volts out to drive a piezo, but at a very low current. So it's fairly straightforward analog stuff, although a rather impressively large surface mount uh, capacitor there. I've never seen anything like that big before. So it's got three, you've got the output of the piezo power in at five volts and the signal in through these again rather expensive uh, limo feed through connectors and it looks like this piezo actuator is just putting pressure on this mirror assembly i think it's not quite clear I don't, i'm not sure if the mirror is mounted to it or whether there's a plate here that it's flexing that machine vision camera output say a weird format it's 30 frames a second non-insulate so i can't immediately display it on the monitor so i've just stuck my camcorder in the uh, same position as the camera plus lens assembly was um, i've got no idea what distance this would normally be used at so i'm just sort of guessing this is about a uh, i don't know 600 six or 700 millimeters or so um this is just firing a uh, sheet of white paper the, the black mark is just a line that i drew on it just to help focusing and the um i'm just putting applying a square wave to the actuator and if you can just hear that you can actually see that yeah you do see a distinct change in the image when the actuator changes um this might get mangled a little bit by uh, google's compression i'll do a zoomed in section just in case to make it a bit clearer to see but you can see a definite change obviously this will be a, have a lot of yeah, processing apl uh, applied to it to try and actually get uh, useful information out of it I can't immediately find the actual spec to know what sort of dimensions this can actually measure to, whether it's comparable to the laser wavelength or, or larger. Maybe it's using yeah, multiple wavelengths or something. I don't don't really know. Uh, this is another shot with the laser illuminating at a more sort of glancing angle. And again, I have no idea how this would normally be set up. Uh, again, you can see a small change in the image with the piezo. So we've got some quite nice interference patterns going on. Um, so that sweeping is the effect of the signal I'm putting into the piezo actuator. So if I turn that off, just to go stationary, turn it on. I'm just putting a ramp through that. I'm not sure the slightest touch on this, it, it changes because it's really super sensitive and this isn't a very uh, well set up a uh, rig it's just sort of sat on the bench it's not clamped down or anything yeah i'm not totally sure whether this is going to be working based on this interference pattern or the speckle pattern change um because the and it, it, it's extremely sensitive to motion um locally towards to the camera when it's when I get the interference lines but not so much on the actual surface I wonder if that interference pattern is actually something that's happening locally within the beam splitter and it's actually looking at the um yeah looking more at the uh speckle rather than interference because I'm, I'm actually moving the the target quite a lot and the interference bands aren't really changing at all but yeah the slightest touch on the mirror adjustment and the uh interference bands go all over the place Someone that knows a bit more about optics could uh, chip in in the comments. So just taking the top cover off this, it makes a little bit clear what's going on now. We've got this beam splitter and there's two mirrors. There's this one which is fixed but adjustable in X and Y uh, tilt by these two adjusters and these are accessible from the outside. And the second mirror is mounted on the uh, piezo actuator. So we've got sort of one like, direct light path which goes sort of in, bounces off that mirror then off then in this direction then the other one which comes in goes off this mirror and then goes straight into the um, camera this piezo is sort of generating a difference in the um, distance the light's traveling through those two paths okay so a quick look at this laser um, this is the power supply unit it's fairly straightforward there's a, an hours ind indicator here this was showing about 770 hours run so obviously um, things like laser diodes have a yeah, certain lifetime so it's not uncommon to find a, an hours indicator on lasers of, uh, of all kinds really this is just mounted on a big sort of chunky heat sink and two boards here nothing particularly exciting as a 
pig 16 f877 in charge of everything looks like there's an option for dc to dc converter this needs three power supply lines it's um plus minus 12 and plus five so this is maybe a dc dc to run, uh, to run on a single supply in some versions just some logic i think there's a couple of digital potentiometer ic's there for setting analog levels all analog stuff just a load of op amps load of power transistors on the bottom so this would have been doing things like regulating the couple of peltier elements in the head for lengthening the laser diode temperature and the temperature of the um optical crystal to regulate those to a specific um optimized operating temperature as well as um, regulating the laser diode current and there's also optical feedback so it can regulate to maintain a constant power output but this is all sort of pretty straightforward stuff my little bodger there date codes on this are around the sort of 2000 2002 sort of uh, area so fairly old the, uh, the company L4 Light, um, the UK based company, they no longer list this sort of product in their product catalogue. They seem to have gone to more specialised lasers. So, obviously, things like this, you know, I'd imagine that companies like Coherent pretty much taken the market for just commodity, sort of bog standard lasers. But obviously, smaller companies are probably better offering sort of customizations. I think the um, the optics on this might be uh, slightly custom with this application. So this is, this is the head unit. Obviously there's a heating on the bottom. This would be mostly taking the heat out from the uh, Peltier coolers. I've not been able to get this to just a normal narrow beam. There's a couple of optic lens on here, but even removing that, it still produces a fairly diverging beam. This is just a holder, but it looks like there is actually um, another lens internally. This would need additional optics to produce a parallel beam. Now this actually looks quite a lot different to what I was expecting. Um, the only other ones I've looked inside of this sort of um, size of laser is the coherent compass units, which use a quite interesting method where they've got like a substrate with all the various optical elements soldered down to it. So you can actually get yeah, a very clear indication of how it's all laid out. This is a bit more sort of machine metal. So we can see the 808 nanometer pump diode down here just. Um, there's a Peltier cooler behind it cooling it onto this uh, block and then this is the uh, the double crystal assembly which say there's lots of alignment screws I'm not going to take this apart because uh, I'd like to keep it usable um, they've got various sort of these white wires for the various temperature sensors yeah quite a lot of machining and mechanical uh, stuff going on there not quite sure the vintage it says manufacturing date August 2002 so maybe sort of the more modern ones are a bit, you know, low cost construction this is obviously quite uh, fairly expensive lots of precision machining and probably quite a lot of manual adjustments going on so I'd imagine sort of things like the uh, the compass and that sort of product have probably yeah, overtaken the market because it's just so much cheaper to um, manufacture. So not not a huge amount of interest in this thing, but it was just really the curiosity value of seeing something sort of rather oddball on eBay. But the thing I really don't get is why they made this outer case out of calm fibre, because obviously the all the optical integrity is provided by this sort of big calm fibre box section to provide the rigidity. Um, yeah, I just don't understand why they would go to the expense of making the outer case, which is just you know completely non-structural, out of carbon fibre. The only thing I can think of is you know this thing was made probably to uh, inspect carbon fibre, so you know perhaps it was the people they made it for did the carbon fibre for them because it's just the technology they knew they knew about um, and knew how to do. But uh, rather curious, they clearly uh, very expensive when it uh, was originally made. And say so they've, if you look at the current products on their website, yeah, they they just gone to sort of two boxes with a piece of aluminium um, extrusion between them, which is obviously a much simpler uh, simpler setup. But uh, I'd be interested to know uh, a bit more about this.